we go. Why and how does the ball swing? Well, it's a topic that has fascinated cricket lovers since cricket balls were first made, and plenty of theories abound. James Anderson is on the cusp of becoming England's all-time leading wicket-taker, and his craft is evident for all to see. So who better than to give us an insight into swing bowling? But we're also adding another expert into the mix, none other than cricket-loving NASA space scientist Dr. Rabindra Mehta, who we met up with when we were in California. And he has some distinctly interesting, some might say controversial, views on the science of swing bowling. But his knowledge of aerodynamics plays a key role in sending people safely into space. So he's definitely worth listening to. As a child, I couldn't swing the ball. I don't think the weather really affects swing. I couldn't tell you when it's going to swing now. No. That is a myth. Total myth. <laughs> I'm an aeronautical engineer. I do work at NASA here in California, Northern California. And I lead a group of about 30 researchers, mainly experimental work, which means testing, doing research in uh, what we call wind tunnels, which is basically a chamber through which you get controlled airflow. One of the main subjects in aeronautical engineering is, is what we call fluid mechanics. That's exactly what I applied to cricket balls and other balls. It's a perfect fit between my keen interest in cricket and what I studied in uh, college. So the beauty of cricket ball aerodynamics is that it's the same basic principles that we use for airplanes, or space vehicles. What does the flow look like over that vehicle? Where does separation occur? What kind of forces do you get? And it's the same thing we're interested in with a cricket ball. Why does it swing? Because there's a side force on the ball. Cricket is quite popular in California, also on the East Coast. There are probably about 20 to 30 teams in the Bay Area, we call it Northern California. My interest in cricket actually dates back from my young days as a child, because I was born in Kenya, which was a British colony at the time, so we had cricket as one of the main sports. And then I went to England to boarding school. Ended up here in 1981 where, lo and behold, I found cricket. I always wanted to be a batsman, but I was a better bowler than a batsman. Cricket ball is, is unique compared to other balls because we have these six rows of stitching along the equator, as I call it. You can make use of this seam to swing the ball. And so the traditional way, conventional way of swinging the ball is to angle the seam. It's all to do with the ability to release the ball properly. Begin swing of first stop. Oh, a ripper. Oh, what a beauty. Straight. As a child, I couldn't swing the ball. It wasn't until I started working with Mike Watkinson at Lancashire when I was about 18 that he started to teach me how to do it. It was something that came quite natural to me because I had, a, I think my action was quite good in that respect it allowed me to swing the ball. A lot of people tell you to swing it off the the middle finger whereas I use the index finger as the last finger to come off the ball so when I'm bowling I try and sort of almost push it in towards the batsman with that finger and then I think that helps me swing it a little bit later. When we were going through the process of trying to figure out how to do it or how was the best way to do it it was more almost feeling it like it's an off spinner so you're really getting your wrist to do that and the ball's sort of coming out like that. It was really exaggerating that and the thumb kind of just sits on the seam as it is. I wouldn't, it's not something that I really focus on. I wouldn't encourage that to be focused on. The trick is to impart spin so that the seam is rotating very steadily in a stable mode, not wobbly. If it's a wobbly seam, it won't have the same effect. My concentration is the finger that the ball's released off, trying to get the feel of that. I think that helps me keep my wrist in a very similar position. What happens is as the airflow comes along, there's a thin film that forms along the ball. And due to this asymmetry in the shape of the ball, that layer, boundary layer we call it, is affected by the seam on one side, whereas on the other side we have this smooth surface. So it tends to leave the ball, separation as we call it, around the apex on this side. On this side, because it's been tripped, by the seam that separations delayed. So the key word in swing bowling is asymmetry. So that, that's an outswinger. So just tilted. I mean, that's something, again, you, you play with, uh, but generally I'll start with it tilted to about second, third slip. Um, and then the inswinger would be just tilted around the other way. And again, when I said the outswinger comes off, I, I push it off that finger. Uh, the inswinger, I push off the middle finger. And again, that sort of, it pushes it there. 
and it goes, it makes it go late. I reckon I was 27, 26, 27, when I was at, like, I could bowl it at will. I was very comfortable, very confident knowing where it was going. Before that, it was a bit of a lottery, really, and many keepers down, through the years have been throwing themselves down the leg side trying to get hold of one of my in-swingers. This is my all-time favourite photograph. It explains the whole theory of cricket ball swing in one shot. Seams angled, the flow is from left to right. The boundary layer, as we call it, on the top surface is in this very steady laminar state, we call it, coming from the word laminate. So it's a very smooth edge and it leaves the surface around the apex of the ball. On the other side, the seam has, has tripped that laminar boundary layer into a more energetic, what we call turbulent state. The turbulence, since it has more energy, delays the separation. So we have separation of the boundary layer around the apex on the non-seam side, and it's delayed quite a bit on the seam side. Looking at the smoke at the back, it's deflected, which means there's an asymmetry in the flow field. This asymmetry means the pressures are different, which means there's a side force. So in this particular case, the ball would move downwards as it's flying through the air. So that's why I call it my favorite photograph, because the, the whole phenomenon of conventional swing is explained in, in one shot, one photograph. To try and get the feel of it swinging and seeing the ball, what it was doing as it came out of the hand. As I got more used to it, and as I went off my full run-up, it happened more naturally. And I still sprayed it a little bit, still a few went flying down the leg side, and a few went miles outside off stump. It felt natural to me almost. You know when someone puts something new in front of you, a coach puts something new there, the player almost has to buy into it and I, I could, cause because I could feel it helping me uh, and I knew it was going to be something that would help me in my career and I bought into it and um, just worked as hard as I could at it. Can the design of a particular stadium affect the amount of swing? It can but I doubt that it does. If there was a predominant wind direction for example, if I had a, a wind coming from an angle so what that'll do is make a ball swing even when the seam is not angled because now the effective flow direction has changed. Several players uh, have told me this, Trent Bridge is like the one Anderson loves. This is more of observation of folklore than actual proof. You know, has anybody gone in and got statistics? When I see a ball swing during a hot sunny day, nobody talks about it. When it swings while it's overcast, they say, oh look, it's the right weather. <laughs> do you know when it's going to swing and when it is? No, not really. I think you get, you get an idea sometimes when it's a bit muggy, cloudy and, and, and warm, you think it's going to swing. I mean, there's been days when the sun's been out and it's swung. There's been days when it's been freezing cold, end of April when it's swung. So I, I, I couldn't tell you when it's going to swing now. I don't think the weather really affects swing. I think this is ingrained in our minds. Ironically, when I ask coaches, and I've done this both in Australia and England at least, and ask him to raise hands. How many of you really feel that the weather affects swing? Nobody raises their hand. Privately, they tell me, well, it swings more sometimes, but we don't think it's weather. As a scientist, I can say there is no scientific proof that a ball will swing more on, on a cloudy, overcast day. We get to choose from 12 at the start of the game, and they could be 12 very different balls, varying in color and shape, size. I like something that just sits in the hand nicely, feels quite small. I think it's because people have always done it in the past, we go for dark coloured balls. So the darker the, the red, the better. I call a lot of this the placebo effect. You know, you, you feel like the red ball is better. <laughs> you feel better about finding the right ball from the box and, and you know, off you go. I still maintain that any decent A grade ball, new ball, a good swing bowler or a bowler who claims to be a swing bowler should be able to swing it on any ground, under any weather conditions, anywhere. Wow, that's a good cherry first up. Jimmy Anderson hooped and it went late. We went to the in-swing and it really went late. No, that is a myth, total myth. <laughs> a ball, when it swings, it follows what we call a parabolic path. Parabolic means as the ball flies down the pitch, it'll increasingly swing. So most of the swing occurs in the latter part of the flight. They claim that the reverse swing ball really moves late, uh, as, as they did with conventional swing. They said, oh, that moved so late, he couldn't see it. It's, it's in the perception, it's the line of the flight. You know, it, practicing in the nets, getting a ball, the coach should rub it on the concrete, trying to get it into the state that it reverse swing. And then you just practice at batters, trying to find your length and line. 
disguise in it. Whenever an old ball swings, the commentators, experts, so-called, will call it reverse swing, and that's just stuck in everybody's mind. I've watched many good reverse swing bowlers. Zahir Khan's one, one of the first guys I remember seeing hiding the ball, and he's a brilliant exponent of it. I watched a lot of him and other people around the world who, who were successful at it, and I've just tried to learn from that. My buddy uh, Imran Khan visited me. This was August of 1980. We were chatting about cricket. He told me that sometimes the ball goes the other way. And to be honest, at the time, I, I didn't believe it because I couldn't figure it out. I didn't understand it. So I thought, oh, you know, he's an economics major. <laughs> Maybe he's confused. <laughs> no, I'm just, just kidding. <laughs> but um, yeah, it was simply that I couldn't explain it. But once we started testing the balls, it became apparent that yes, new ball, if you bowl it at a high enough speed, you're talking about 100 miles an hour or so. Uh, it'll only reverse swing. If you can swing the ball normally, then you can swing the ball re reverse because the seam position is the same. You know, the, the way it comes off your fingers is exactly the same. The problem comes with actually trying to control it. And, you know, a lot of people, when it reverses, they go too full. So trying to find your length is a, another important part. For conventional swing, you want the shiny side facing the batsman, so out swing, in swing. But for reverse, you want to switch it around, have the rough side facing the batsman. So in this case, although the seam is pointing that way, the ball will go in. When I started bowling reverse swing, I was thinking to get an LBW, you've got to really chuck it up there. And that's, that's not the case. You can still bowl the same length you would with a new ball and try and hit the top of the stumps. You know, try and keep it probably not as full as you would with a, a new ball, especially in places like India when it's quite low anyway. You want to be just hitting the top of the stumps. On my visit to the academy in 2005, Loughborough, we decided to do some sessions in the net and they roughened up some of the balls deliberately, scraping them on the concrete, had the bowlers bowl. And I realized that they weren't really bowling with the angled seam at all. They were just bowling with the seam straight up and the ball swung. So it was really due to the contrast in the surface roughness. If you ask any players or, or coaches today uh, what reverse swing is, the one statement you'll hear from almost all of them is it swings towards the shiny side. They will tell you that repeatedly, which for contrast swing is true. If I release this ball with the seam straight up, one side rough, one side smooth, it will swing towards the smooth side. But that's not reverse swing. And that's when I came up with the term contrast swing. For contrast swing, the beauty is you don't need a seam. For conventional and reverse swing, the seam is pretty essential. Say you're bowling on the Indian subcontinent within uh, 10, 20 overs, mm -hmm. depending on the condition. The seam's gone. So how do you swing the ball? That's when this is really effective. If you have one side rough, one side smooth, then it becomes contrast swing. So watch the ball, watch the swing direction, and watch the seam orientation. If it swings in the same direction that the seam is pointing, it's conventional swing. If it swings in the opposite direction, it is reverse swing. If the seam is straight up and the ball still swings, that is contrast swing. And like I said, that is most useful when the seam is gone. And when I first started, when I was 14, 15 year old, I was just holding the seam gun barrel straight and trying to bowl as fast as I could. During my development, when I, even when I started playing first class cricket, there were periods where I tried to swing the ball and then I was fortunate enough to play with really experienced guys like Warren Haig, Neil Fairbrother, people like that who'd come up to me and say, just don't worry about swinging it now, just bowl as fast as you can. So that actually helped me in my development, I think, as well. What if you're one of these unfortunate guys who bowls at a speed where it crosses over from conventional swing to reverse swing? So it's zero, there's no swing. Mike Hendrick, he came and told me that he finally figured out why he could not swing the ball. And if you look at the stats on him, he was bowling around that. But if he had known this at the time, then he could have Increased his speed, got reverse swing, or reduced the speed and got conventional swing. But he didn't, so he kept bowling at the same speed and the ball won't swing. My eureka moment for this fourth type of swing, if you will, uh, came during the 2007 World Cup final in Barbados. Lasit Malinga, he's a unique bowler. And so I started thinking, how is he swinging the ball when you know he's got sidearm and all this? So it turns out that when a ball spins, we all know this from soccer or football, if you put spin about a vertical axis, you can make it bend, bend it like Beckham around the wall. In reality, when a fast bowler releases a ball with backspin, there is a force upwards 
call it the Magnus force, which is opposing gravity. It's, it's not huge, but it is there. But with the sidearm action, what happens is, instead of the force being vertical, it's angled. So there's a sideways component to it. So if I took a, a rough ball, forget a cricket ball, just a rough stone, and I released it with spin along an inclined axis, there will be a sideways force and it'll swing away. And that's what he produces. Now for that ball, you don't need a contrast, you don't need a seam, just need a ball. <laughs> so if you have a ball which is totally useless, you cannot swing it any other way, here's the key. Bolt side arm, put as much spin as you can on it and it'll swing through the air. is a bit good. What I had seen in the past was this effect after the ball pitches. Bowling. He's bowled him left alone, Amler. You see the ball spinning until it hits the ground and then it stops spinning and the seam gets inclined and it goes the other way. That's what fooled the batsman. Oh! Let's get it up, draw him forward. And it's missed the crack. It's... The, the latest one that, that I've come across is the so-called knuckle ball. We have it in baseball where they grab the ball like so and the whole trick is to release the ball with very little spin on it. And what happens there is as the ball flies through the air, the seam position changes. Zahir Khan can do this, and I have a clip that shows that. I think you might see more of that. The slower delivery, knuckle it rather than just change the speed. Like I said, there's no reason why a coach needs to go to you know, Imperial College and get a degree in engineering. That's not the point. The point is, uh, listen to people who know what they're talking about, and from that, absorb the important facts, and then use them. Do it in the nets, you know, you don't have to believe in it. It's not rocket science. <laughs>